Amen. Is Jesus my Lord? Amen. And He truly is. Amen. Take your Bibles with me this morning to Acts 27 again. Acts chapter number 27. And uh, we'll look at this passage of Scripture together. And uh, we are making our way towards the end of the chapter. Uh, making application as we uh, walk our way down through this text. Uh, Matthew, excuse me, Acts 27. And uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 9 when you find your place. I'll invite you to stand and reverence the reading of the Word of God. Uh, Acts chapter number 27, uh, verse number 9. Everyone standing if you're physically able. The Bible says in Acts 27 and verse number 9, And when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the landing and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to fitness and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. And when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and so were driven. And we ended last week there in verse number 17. We pick up our reading for this morning's message in verse number 18. And the Bible says, And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And verse 20 is where we'll take, uh, our begin our thought for this morning. Where the Bible says, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Verse 21. And after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. You may be seated. Let's bow for a word of prayer together and then we will get into the message for this morning. Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. Thank You, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to be in the house of God with the people of God. Thank You, Lord, for the privilege that we have to have a Bible to open this morning. Lord, to open it up, to look in its pages, to preach from its pages. And Lord God, to hear what your message would be for us today. Lord, I realize I do not have a message for these people, Lord, unless you help me. Lord, I cannot preach. I am human. And Lord God, we know that humans cannot preach the Word of God. Only the Spirit of God can truly preach your Word to your people. Lord, I pray, dear God, that the Holy Ghost of God would have all of me this morning would take my body, take my lips, take my voice and my vocal cords. Lord, I pray that you would do a work and make it usable for your service. Forgive us of sin, empty us of self. Fill us, Lord, I pray with your spirit that we can be used for your glory to do something that will last not only today, but into eternity. 
Father, I pray that You would do an eternal work in our hearts and lives. Lord God, that none of us would leave the same, but that every single person would leave different. Knowing more about You, being corrected, being reproved. Lord God, knowing Your will for their life, being saved if they're not saved, getting right with You if they're backslid, being fed with the Word of God for the saint of God that's hungry. Lord, having refreshing uh, refreshing uh, her, uh, 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 message from God for those that are thirsty. Lord, I pray that Your will would be done in every way and any way You see fit. Lord God, get the glory now we pray. Lord, do that which only You can do in our midst. And we'll be, we'll be careful to give You all the praise, the honor, and the glory for that which You do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, for the last several weeks, we've been looking here at Acts chapter number 27. And uh, we are uh, coming to, uh, to about halfway through this chapter. And uh, don't worry, all of the... Uh, most of the preaching is done in the first half of this chapter, amen. Uh, but as we come to this chapter, Acts chapter number 27, I've mentioned it in the introduction part. Uh, for those of you that may not have been here through the, the whole uh, study in this chapter, uh, but I've mentioned that the context of these verses uh, is that Paul has been arrested uh, for serving the Lord in his service for the Lord. He has put on a prison ship there in verse number 1 of Acts 27, and uh, we see them sailing through the waters, and it gives us their location in verse number 1 through verse number 8. The narrative of the message begins in verse number 9, uh, where the Bible says that they began in their sailing to encounter dangerous winds, and uh, they began to be on this voyage, and uh, there were some problems that came as they were along this voyage. Verse 1 said that sailing was now dangerous, and because Paul on this ship, as the man of God, with, with a spiritual discernment about him, and the Holy Ghost of God speaking to his heart, he realized that there was that danger that they were in, uh, was a danger that needed to be addressed. And uh, Paul, as God's man, was trying to help them, was trying to warn them, trying to instruct them into going in a way that God would have for them to go instead of going further into the dangerous storm. Verse number 9 uh, said that Paul admonished them or Paul advised them. He reprimanded them in a way. He warned them. Verse 10 said that he declared to them, Sirs, I perceive that Holy Ghost perception. I said, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading in the ship, not only of the stuff that we have in the boat, the cargo that we have in the boat, not only will that be lost and the ship itself, but he said, I perceive that there's a danger of us losing our own lives. Verse number 10. However, verse number 11 says that those that were in charge of the ship the centurion, that one that was his arresting officer, uh, sent and commissioned by Rome to bring him uh, to Rome. Uh, that centurion, uh, the master and the owner of the ship as well, uh, the Bible says that they believed, the centurion believed not the master and the owner of the ship more than those words, or he believed rather the master and the owner of the ship more than the words that were spoken by Paul. God gave him a word. He gave it to those people to try to help them and, and try to warn them. They chose to turn a deaf ear to it. They chose to ignore it. And by doing so, they went on a voluntary voyage out of the will of God. Uh, this, this journey for Paul uh, was God's will for him to be on, but he told them that it was not God's will for them to go forward. If they wanted to be safe, if they wanted to be secure, if they wanted to avoid danger, they needed to listen to God and they needed to stop where they were, not lose from Crete, and not go forward in this journey. They voluntarily chose to ignore God's will and by doing so, and many people don't think this is what they do, when they make decisions to ignore the preaching, to ignore the words of God that they read and they study, when God speaks to them off of the pages of the Word of God, either using a human instrument or not, when God speaks to us and we choose to ignore what God says, guess what you're doing? You're embracing danger. 
Amen. That's what they did. They chose to ignore the safe path because they thought that they understood better than Paul. They saw this, this captain of the boat and the advice that he gives in verse number 12. They saw in verse number 13 the south winds blowing softly. What they hear and what they saw was what they used to make their decisions. But how many times have we learned in life that sometimes what we hear is not always the truth? Sometimes what we see and what we perceive through human knowledge and human perception is not always the truth. And they use human perception as opposed to Holy Ghost perception. And by doing so, they shunned safety. They shunned a life that was directed by God. And God always directed them in paths of safety. As a, and by doing so, they shunned the safety, embraced the danger, and went on a voluntary voyage out of the will of God. By doing so, they entered into a voyage that was a deceptive voyage. That was number one. We looked at that. They went on a voyage that was a dangerous voyage. We saw that in verse number nine. They went on a voyage that was a damaging voyage. Verse number ten. This voyage will be with, with her and much damage. Not only of the lady and ship, but also of our lives. And then last week we saw that by embracing a voluntary voyage out of the will of God and choosing to ignore God's warning uh, instead of embracing the word that God had sent uh, Paul to give them, they also went on what I coined a driven voyage. Verse number 15 and verse number 17 uses, verse 15 uses the word drive. Verse 17 uses the word driven. Verse 14 says, And when not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Jeroplodon. Verse 15, And when the ship was called and could not bear up into the wind, they were stuck, they were caught. I, I, just reading that, 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 little, uh, that little sentence there and, and where the Bible says, And when the ship was caught. I don't know how you read your Bible, but when I read the word caught, that struck me in my heart. Yeah. You want to talk about danger? You want to talk about a scary place to be in? To be in the middle of a storm so big that God had to give it a name? And being a, you know, and we weren't the ones that, that uh, started naming storms. Amen. God did that. And God gave it this name. And therefore, I'd say this had to be a pretty big storm. Most commentators believe this was a massive hurricane that they were involved in. This storm called Jeroglodon, the Bible said they were in a boat in the middle of that storm, and now they're caught in the middle of it. They're stuck slap dab in the middle of it, and they, they, what they were trying to do was because they were caught, they were trying to break themselves free. They were trying to drive the boat. They were trying to steer it. They said they could not bear up into the wind all of their physical ability for control was lost. That's why they were caught. Have you ever been somewhere in your life you made a decision to go against God and His Word and you found yourself in a place that you had been caught by your sin? You felt like you were just stuck in the middle of, of a place spiritually that you didn't know if you were going to get out or not and you, you, just, you, you tried your best to steer your life the right way and you couldn't do it. The Bible said their solution they took their hands off and said, we're going to let her drive. We're going to let this ship make it. Like, we can't direct it anymore. We, we, we made our decision. When, listen to this. When, when, when they had the opportunity to control the direction, they chose to not choose the right control. And because of that, it led them to a place where they were no longer in control. That you have the opportunity today to make the right choice. To still sit in the driver's seat as God lets you make decisions. But if you go against God and His way, I promise you there will be a day where your sin will cause your life to come to the place to where you're so, uh, where you're, uh, you, your, your sin is so encompassing that you say, I'm tired of trying to get it back to where it needs to be. Yeah. Now, I'm telling you, it, 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 it's... If you have ever walked away from God, I, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. If you've ever left church, you know how hard it is to try to get back in and to get faithful. Amen. You know, your life is driving itself. You're letting it drive. 
We saw that last week. They let her drive. Here, let me give you this one. I could preach that and preach that. And uh, that, that, I'm, that may end up coming back up six months from now. Amen. I'm tell, to me, that's where a lot of our people are. Yeah. They, they chose, they made a decision to ignore God, ignore His Word, ignore what they know is right. And now their life is controlling it. The devil's controlling it. Their flesh is in the driver's seat. The world's in the driver's seat. And uh, that's not where we need to be. And by, if you go on a voluntary voyage out of the will of God, you may not think it may ever come to that, but I promise you on the authority of this King James Bible, it will come to that. This is a progression. It may start with deception like it did here. They looked and they saw and they were confused and they made a decision based on the deception they had. But the deception led all the way to them giving up and letting the life, the flesh, drive itself. This morning, if I can, I'd like to give you two thoughts. I'll be satisfied if we get through one. But I'd like to give you two of these if I can. The first one I want us to look at is in verse number 20. Not only is a, a volunt, the, this voyage that's voluntary, it's what we're preaching on, not only is this voyage a deceptive voyage and a dangerous voyage and a damaging voyage and a driven voyage, but number five, this voyage is a discouraging voyage. A discouraging voyage. Notice verse number 20. This is how, this is where they, they made this decision. To walk out of the will of God. Y'all look up at me just one moment. I know I told you to look at verse 20. This is the most faithful group of people to read your Bible in church that I've ever seen. Because if I say look at a verse, Brother Leon, this crowd, I could preach for an hour. If I didn't tell you to lift your head off the verse, you're going to sit there and listen to me in the background while staring at the verse that I've never read in the past hour. Amen. Y'all, if, 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 if I tell you to turn to a verse... And then I back up and preach a little while. Y'all can lift your head up. And when I start reading the verse, lift it back down, all right? When I said, y'all look up at me, everybody in this congregation at the same time did this. I appreciate the faithfulness. Amen. Thank God for that. This church, I don't know whether it is just a hunger for the Bible. Uh, or if it's y'all don't trust me very much. Uh, because I'm preaching. Y'all gonna make sure. I'm gonna make sure that's in there. Bless God. I'm gonna make sure it's in there. <laughs> Amen. I promise. I'm not trying to deceive you. I do appreciate that though. The Bible commands us to be that way. Amen. Search the scriptures to see if they're so. Amen. You thank God. Uh, Beacon Baptist Church is turning into a Berean Baptist Church. They were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures. Amen. Uh, thank God for that. But th think about this now here in verse number 20. Uh, you don't have, uh, I said verse 20, you don't have to look at it right now. Amen. I'll tell you when to look at it. <laughs> in verse 20, they're about to describe how discouraged they really are. They're about to tell you where that one decision to not listen to God's Word brought them in their emotions. I don't know how many people in this room deal with the emotional battles, but I promise you the Bible here says that that decision that they made in the beginning of the chapter brought them to the place to where their emotions were a wreck. In this nation, I know Brother Tom has already taught it in Sunday school, but in this nation you would be surprised how many people have emotional problems, have problems with depression, have problems with being disappointed, need to be encouraged all the time? I, I've had people, I, I've had people in our church tell me, "Say, preacher, I'm thankful." That you're always so encouraging to me when we talk one on one. You seem like you're interested, and you know why? I, mean, I as a pastor have to do that, and I make sure to try to do my best, even though I may be discouraged myself, even though I may have some issues myself. I, I want to to pick you up and try to be encouraging to you and lift your spirits, it's because as the pastor of this church, it is my job to set the stage and to be the be the standard of faith. And guess what? I know we do with emotional problems. I know we deal with discouraging days. This world is a discouraging world to live in, especially to a Christian that loves God and loves the truth and sees this world going to hell in a handbasket. It's a discouraging thing. 
It'll, if you live long enough in this world, your heart will be broken time and time and time again. That's why I preach on dating the way that I do and give. And I gave that month long that Sunday school series here in the church on dating because the world's going to break your heart enough. Yeah. Why well, hand it out to people yeah. to break it even more? Right. To where instead of broken pieces, now you have sand left because you've broken your pieces of your heart so many times. The world is going to break our hearts. Our, heart, our emotions are going to be all over the place in life. But, and I understand there are people who deal with depression clinically. My mom's in heaven now, but my mom was someone who was always depressed. Clinically depressed. I understand there are chemical imbalances in our body that bring that on. I understand that it is an actual medical plague to feel that way. Some of you in this building may struggle with that. But I do believe with all of my heart that everybody who has major depression in their life that has suicidal tendencies, by the way, that's one of the leading causes of death among people under 25. Suicide. Because we don't, at that, at that point, they have not, they have many of the younger ones uh, teenagers and younger teenagers and preteens, they have not graduated yet in their faculties and in their intellect and in their understanding of the world to grasp everything the world's sending at them. But they do know how to end it. And that's sad. That is real. It is rampant. But it's not all from people being what we would call crazy. People having... Uh, you know, you got you got those that have just struggled with it. You've got those who need medicine to help. You've got all of these issues, but I don't believe it's all because of that. The Bible says here, and it definitively proves that our decisions concerning God, His Word, and His will will bring discouragement in yes, our life. You're right. As, as a Christian, if you are saved by the grace of God and you constantly choose to disobey or to be straddling a fence, to be half-hearted in your Christian life, there's no wonder why you're depressed. That's right. There's no wonder why you're discouraged. You know why? Because you know that there is a God. You know that He does have a standard of holiness because He is a holy God. You know He demands it of you, but you, for your own volition, have chosen to fall short of it. You know God has a standard. You know God has a will. You know what God expects of you, but you still make decisions to go against that. That would plague my mind. And when I make those decisions, it does. It's called conviction. Hebrews 12 calls it the chastisement of God. God can chastise us and punish us. It's not always God sending you to the hospital physically. Actually, that's probably one of the least forms of chastisement is physical chastisement from God. I do believe that's headed if you still choose to continuously disobey, continuously disobey. But the first place God will punish us is in our heart and in our knowledge of what's right. We get discouraged because the one way to be encouraged as a Christian is to follow the Lord Amen. and obey the Lord. Now, look at verse 20 with me. This is where their sin brought them to a place where their emotions are wrecked. Listen to how they say they're feeling. Look at verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared. Let's stop right there for a moment. If you never saw the sunshine or the moon, he said, the sun of the stars. If you never saw the sun during the day or any kind of illuminating lights like the stars at night, and all you ever saw was darkness, how depressed do you think you would be? How discouraged do you think? Where would that bring your mind? My mom was what I call a seasonally depressed person. She would, and I don't, I don't know the science behind this, I just know what she told me. In the summer, she was at her best. But when the sun started going down and, and, and when the, the days were getting shorter or whatever and during the winter time and things where it just looked a little bit more bleak and there wasn't, and, and there, there wasn't leaves on the trees and it just looked more bleak outside, it messed with her emotions. So I can, I, I've lived this. I saw this in my mom, this, 
no light makes you, no light physically can make you think that there is no light emotionally. They said that the storm brought it to where they didn't see the sun and they didn't see the stars in many days. They said no small tempest lay on us. The storm was still at full force. It was not a small issue they were dealing with. Here's what the Bible said. Here's how they were feeling. They said all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Have you ever in your life, and again, you don't have to answer this out loud, just in your heart, be honest with you and God, has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like there was no hope for you? They said all hope that we should be saved, all hope that we should be delivered from this storm was then taken away. Guess what? They would not have felt that way if they would have listened to Paul in the beginning. Because they they were discouraged because they were in the middle of the storm and they didn't have hope they were ever going to get out of the storm. If they would have listened to Paul, they never would have went into it. They never would have felt trapped in the darkness of the storm. The, the Bible says that they they lost all hope. They were in a discouraging storm. It was a discouraging voyage, and if you choose, and if I choose to walk away from God and what we know is right and what the Bible declares is right and what God's Word instructs us in, if we walk away from that choosing our flesh and our sin and our feelings and ourselves over what God wants, I promise you, you may have never dealt with it before, but I promise you if you go that far out of sin, you will be discouraged. You will be depressed. You will be despondent. You will be downcast. I promise you you will be. If you wonder why you're struggling with it now, if I was you, I'd take inventory of my decisions when it came to God and His Word. Some of you do not need medicine to get out of your discouragement. You just need to obey God. You just need to listen to the Lord. Some of you, the hope that you have of getting out of where you are emotionally is not another pill. It's not another prescription. It's not another visit to the doctor. It's not not any myriad of other things that you may think will get it fixed. But it will just be one trip down to the altar, one prayer to the Lord, repenting of your sin, saying, God, I'm yours. I want you to help me. I want you to help me be faithful. I'm sorry for not listening. And I'm going to listen now. Amen. Amen. One trip to the altar could be the prescription that the doctor ordered for you this morning. Go with me please to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter number 10. I want to illustrate this for you just a minute. I want to use Solomon to do so. 1 Kings chapter number 10. 1 Kings chapter number 10. Here in 1 Kings chapter 10, this verse is famous in God, this chapter is famous in God's Word for being the moment when the Queen of Sheba left Sheba came to Solomon's palace. Solomon has been king in Israel. He is the king of the nation of Israel. And he, he, she has come to visit Solomon. And while she's there, she's amazed at everything that God has given to Solomon. One of the most famous verses in this, in this chapter, and to be honest with you, it's one of my, it's one of my favorites. It's where, it's where she said in verse number, uh, verse number 7, Talking about when she came to Solomon's temple. Uh, the Bible says in verse 7, How be it, I believed not the words, everything they told me about Solomon, everything they told me about his wealth, everything they told me about his kingdom, everything they told me about how wonderful Solomon is and how God has blessed him. Uh, the, how, she said, How be it, I believed not the words that they told her about him. I believed not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. She said, and behold the half. I love this verse. The half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity 
prosperity exceedeth, goes beyond, and far outweighs the fame of which I heard. Amen. She said, I looked around and saw all of your wealth. And it was, the half wasn't told about how wealthy you are. Amen. The half was not told about uh, how great this kingdom is, how beautiful this place is. Uh, and, and that's a great verse, and I love that verse. But in that vein of thought, the half was not told. She's talking about the things of Solomon's kingdom that amazed her about Solomon. Look at verse number 8. Here's one thing that she was amazed by. She says she's walking around the kingdom. She's looking around at what Solomon has. She's amazed by this. She said, Happy are thy men. Happy are, those, are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Not only was it the wealth that he had and the splendor of his kingdom and the magnificence of the kingdom, but as she looked around, there was something that she saw that amazed her about Solomon's kingdom. And it was how happy his servants were. If, and if you ever in this life encounter someone that is genuinely, truly happy, I promise it will make a mark on your day. I remember one time, uh, not this actually not very long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, me and my wife were headed to a revival meeting somewhere out of town. I don't know whether we were headed to Greenville to her home church or Cal Penn's to my home church, but it was one of the two. And uh, we were attending the revival meeting there. And uh, I remember we went in the gas station to get some drinks. Uh, we had a long ride ahead, and we went in to get some drinks. I went in. I paid for the drinks, and the lady behind the counter uh, asked me. She, she said, how are you doing? Just... You know, just throwing that out there the way they do. They do it a million times a day. And so they just, it's got to happen. Just throwing it out. How are you doing? And I stopped. Uh, I was getting ready to pay, but I stopped and I looked up at her. And I said, I'm doing fantastic. She was just ringing my stuff. And I said, I'm doing fantastic. Just like that. She did this. Gave me the most confused look. And went back down and bagged my stuff. Have a good day. And I said, I am. I hope you are. I hope you will have a great day. But just the fact that I told her in an excited, happy voice, I'm doing fantastic. Blown away. To encounter someone that has some happiness in their life, I promise, and I wasn't aiming for this, but I promise she got home and she remembered me coming in that story. She's blown away. She's used to everybody coming in and telling them all the problems they've ever had. You, and I have problems just like anybody else did. Thank God I'm saved by the grace of God. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. It doesn't matter how bad everything. I'm doing fantastic. Praise God. I know Jesus. Amen. He's my Savior. I'm headed home to be with Him. If everything in this world goes to pot, I'm going to heaven when I die. Praise the Lord. I'm doing fantastic. Amen. Happiness. She was amazed by the happiness that she saw in people that were serving. They were under His authority. He was their king. He was their master. And while they were working, they were happy. I would to God we'd go to our jobs and we would be those happy people while we're serving. It may not be the best day. It may not be the, the, the most the pleasurable job. It may not be exciting. We go to our job and we're excited to live. We're excited to know the Lord. And we go in and we're joyful and we're happy. And we let people know that we're like this because of the King in our life. Because not of Solomon, but the one greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ. It will make a difference. Yes, sir. We have one text, Acts 27, they're discouraged. They have no hope, their emotions are a wreck. Then you have another text, 1 Kings chapter number 10, and they are happy, so much so, she was amazed at their happiness. Notice why the Bible says they were happy. Number one, she says in verse number 8, Happy are thy men, so they belong to the king. If you belong to King Jesus through salvation, 
Amen. You ought to be very happy this morning. Amen. 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 They belong to Jesus. Happy are thy men. They belong to the king. Then she said, Happy are these thy servants. What the servants mean? Not only did they belong to the king, they were doing what their master said to do. That's what a servant is. Amen. Someone that does what the master says. Why were they happy? Because the king gave a command and they did what he said. Y'all see the connection? In, in Acts 27, they were discouraged because God through Paul, the king of glory, through the man of God, gave them a command and they did not do what the king said. That's right. Therefore, they were discouraged. You want excitement, you want happiness, you want true joy in your life. If you're a Christian, hear the word of God and do what God says. You'll be happy. Amen. Amen. You won't be discouraged. I'm not telling you'll never be discouraged. I'm saying that reason for being discouraged will be gone. You will never be discouraged for not obeying the Lord and sinning against the Lord if you do what He says. Amen. Notice this, not only that, she calls him thy men. She says, happy are thy servants. But notice this, here's one of the other reasons why they were happy. Which stand continually before thee. They were in the presence of the king. It's hard to be discouraged in the presence of royalty as glorious as King Solomon was. And Matthew declares that if they had a reason to be happy by being in the wonder in the majestic presence of King Solomon. Matthew declares in Matthew chapter number 12 that there is one that is greater than Solomon and his name is Jesus Christ. If they had a reason to be happy in Solomon's presence, you and I have a reason to be happy in the presence of the Lord and without being obedient, you're never going to be in the presence of God. The Bible says Isaiah 59 says our sins have separated us between us and our God. The Bible says if we regard, if we hold iniquity close to us, if we make reason for it, make excuse for it, if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. The relationship, the fellowship, you're still going to go to heaven, but that fellowship, that closeness will be broken. Just like one of these kids disobeys mom and dad. I promise if... Uh, if, if you think about you being a child, if you disobeyed dad, the last thing you wanted to or disobeyed mom while dad was at work, the last thing you wanted to see is dad's car pull in the driveway. Because <laughs> mom has told you all day, if you don't stop, I'm going to tell your dad. You said you did what she said not to do. Not only did mama give you a spanking when dad's car came in, it was as sure as done. Dad was going to spank you too. If you had good parents anyway, amen. But Caldwell, is that not right, amen? I'm, I'm sure you got two or three spankings, amen. Amen. In your generation, if you disobeyed, you probably got it from the teacher, then you got it from mama, then you got it from daddy, amen. Probably good to go back that way, amen. Probably would be able to empty out some of our prisons if we did that, amen. Amen. You know why you didn't want to see dad driving down the road? Because you're out of, you're out, you're out of fellowship with dad. You're out of sorts with Dad. Until that fellowship gets right, you don't want to see Him in judgment. Same way with our sin. Why do we try to hide from God? Why don't we think we are anyway? Why do we uh, try to distance ourselves from the Bible when we're in sin? Because that Bible tells us that Dad's disappointed with us. And I use that reverence, irreverently. I'm not using that in a, in a negative way. Our Father's disappointed in us. That Bible lets us know He's disappointed in us. Why is it when you're out of sorts with God, you don't want to pray? Because if you're talking to Him, you're having a conversation with Him, He'll let you know what you did. I'm not pleased with. Amen. The Bible says they were happy because they were in His presence. They were in that presence in a, fel a communion, in a fellowship. And notice what it says next. They were continually in His presence and they were happy because they heard his wisdom. That word here in the text gives the idea of obedience. Not only did they hear it, but they truly heard it so much they put it into practice. So you can hear what I'm saying this morning, but you didn't listen until you put it into practice. They heard it, but the word here implies 
that they obeyed it as well. It means to hear intelligently. It means to regard His words. And the reason why the people of this crew here in Acts 27, the reason why they were discouraged is because they did not regard, did not hear intelligently. They did not, uh, they did not obey what God told them. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Those that keep obey the Bible, happy is he. The Bible says in Psalm 106.3, Blessed or happy is another, is another way to uh, define that word. Uh, blessed are they that keep judgment. Those that obey the judgment of God, the Word of God. And he that doeth righteousness at all times. You don't have nothing to be disappointed in if you're obeying God as much as you can while you can. Psalm 119.2 says, Blessed or happy are they that keep His testimonies. Again, another word for the Bible. And that seek Him with the whole heart. Let me encourage you today. If you are not where you want to be emotionally, if you're discouraged, downcast, depressed, or despondent, let me invite you to come down to an old time altar with me and some, with where I am and where some of our church workers, if we need that many, can meet you, take a Bible, show you how to get encouraged from God's Word. How to switch your situation by being obedient to Christ and let Him encourage your heart today. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm done preaching this morning. If you need